Thanks for listening to Maxie's Musical Podcast. If you like what you hear today, be sure to like it, share it, review it, and subscribe to it. Also, be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok for regular updates about upcoming episodes. Today, we're brought to you by Metro Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram at Chicopee. Check out their state-of-the-art dealership next to BJ's and Big Y on Memorial Drive, or check out MetroJeep.com and drive home in your new Metro Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram today. And now here's today's episode of Baxi's Musical Podcast. Vexy's Musical Podcast. Crazy stars is useless. During the last four and a half years, I read nearly 45 to 50 different rock star biographies and memoirs. Here's what I found out. Most people, even rock stars, are not that interesting all the time. I've even read a few books where I've learned that some of these people are not that interesting most of the time. So when a memoir comes out that takes a creative approach and is written with a quirky point of view, it's like a breath of fresh air in a vast field of total self-absorption. So when you're going to write a book about yourself and you find a way to avoid the temptation of total self-indulgence, that's the book I want to read. If I were going to write a book about my own life story, it would quickly become obvious that there really only have been a handful of years where interesting stuff actually happened. And among those years, there's probably only two or three stories that might bear repeating. That's why I'm not writing one. And then you have Robin Hitchcock. Since 1972, Robin Hitchcock has released more than 30 albums. That includes a pair of records with his first band, The Soft Boys, multiple solo records, and a bunch of records with his bands, The Egyptians, The Venus Three, and loads of other incredible collaborations. He has had a fascinating career that has cemented his well-deserved reputation as one of the most original and influential musicians in history. His catalog is loaded with unexpected gems, music that can be as surreal as it is insightful. Add that to almost 50 years of continuous touring and it becomes very hard not to respect the prolific output that Robin has become known for. His music is nothing short of wondrous. If there was ever a guy who earned the right to tell his entire life story in a book, it would be Robin Hitchcock. But Robin had other ideas. Rather than cram 71 years of achievements and vague recollections into an impossibly dense manifesto, Robin decided to focus his entire attention on the year 1967. This was a pivotal year in which a 14-year-old Robin Hitchcock is sent away to boarding school, discovers himself in the midst of his awkward, newly found puberty, while also discovering the music that would completely shape the rest of his life and influence his entire career. The name of the book is 1967, How I Got There and Why I Never Left. And it's exceptional because not only does it give you a perfectly clear understanding of who he was as a 14-year-old boy, it also gives you a better understanding of why. And from that information, you can better understand the man at 71 years old. And in the world of memoirs and autobiographies, that's the sort of stuff that isn't always clearly stated, which makes Robin Hitchcock's 1967 seem somewhat like a unicorn. Because while it seems like a strange concept for a memoir, it winds up making perfect sense. On top of that, Robin has just released his latest album as a companion piece to the book entitled 1967 Vacations in the Past. It's an album that includes largely acoustic interpretations of the music of that pivotal year. Songs from the Beatles, Jimi Hendrix, Procol Harum, Pink Floyd, The Kinks, and many others. And like the book, it's equally amazing as he takes his typical unique spin on some of the most important songs of his life. It's not just an album of cover songs. It's a soundtrack. It's a mixtape. It's a photograph of who he used to be and who he would become. Robin Hitchcock is currently back on the road. In fact, he'll be coming to the City Winery in Boston on October 29th. I spoke with Robin in 2022 just before the release of his album Shuffle Mania, which I thought was one of the best albums of the year. So to speak to him again with an even greater understanding of his history in 1967 is a real honor. That's why it's great to welcome back Robin Hitchcock to Baxi's Musical Podcast. I want to start by giving you a compliment here because over the last few years, I've read a lot of rock star memoirs and, and autobiographies, and, and some of them are very good, and some of them are just 
absolutely dreadful, <laughs> self-indulgent garbage, to be honest, which is why your book is such a remarkable breath of fresh air. I mean, selecting... Oh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed it. And, and it, it took... I actually read through it twice because I wanted to make sure I had everything. Wow. To select a single year of your life that not only defines you, you know, not just as a musician, but really defines you as an individual, is a really yeah. novel approach to writing any memoir. Tell me a little bit about the decision to not just focus on one year, but specifically about 1967 itself. Well, the idea to focus on one year came from my wife yet again, Emma. Uh, when various offers came in for me to write a memoir, she said, just pick one period, pick one thing. Uh, and for me then, it was a no-brainer, as they say. Um, I went straight back into 1967 because that was the crucible for me. But it also coincided with the crucible, the crucible of our zeitgeist, or rather its own zeitgeist. It's the only time the zeitgeist and I have been in, in tandem, <laughs> arm in arm, you know, I was absolutely level with it just at that one point. I followed every record that came out, you know, listened to all, I listened to everything, I read everything, I absorbed all the information, and I've been processing it ever since. But it turned out that 1966 slash 67, because really this book is about 66 as well, became the big bang of our culture. You know, it's where pop turned into rock, suddenly rhythm guitarists vanished and there was great just hundreds of effects pedals and whacking great amplifiers and you know culturally everything finally left world war ii i mean it wasn't necessarily the beginning of a new age and we might be witnessing it's it's certainly struggling at the moment because the the forces of regression are doing their absolute best to try and put everything back into a sort of pre-1950 box uh, you know, the old white man's world, et cetera, et cetera, um, which has, let's just say time has moved very fast and not everybody can keep up with it, including me, you know. It's interesting to have chosen, you know, 1967, because, you know, historically, when you look at things culturally, are exploding with such speed. And, I, and they're doing that now, too. But I think if you, if you look back at the simplicity of the 60s, combined with all the complexity of the 60s. Yeah, it's a pretty, it's yeah. a pretty interesting time. And you know, I was born in 66. But oh, right. So I, I, I missed a lot of this. But you know, as I look back and see things like the Beatles, for example, I mean, it, it plays a big part oh, yes. in, in the story. But you know, it's five years between Love Me Do to you know, A Day in the Life. That kind of progression is just, it's unheard of. I mean, you've done a million albums, but you do, you're not doing like you know 15 albums and 35 singles in a year. I mean, it's just a, it's amazing that 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 was that that no. happened back then. No, and I'm not accelerating. I'm doing much. I'm I've kind of made much the same music my whole career. Maybe, maybe it shows that I'm now in my 70s and I was once in my 20s. But it's not like my approach or my what sounds I love change. I'm, I'm still aiming for the same thing, which was basically what the Beatles had already done. But they happened to be part of that momentum and arguably that momentum blossomed, peaked, exploded, whatever you want to call it, in 67. And then gradually, you know, the pendulum began to swing back. Hopefully it won't swing back all the way, but, you know, it was... There was so much acceleration culturally and, and most of all musically. So... All those records that came out then that I talk about in the book, Piper at the Gates of Dawn, Are You Experienced, Revolver, Blonde on Blonde, they haven't been superseded. Nobody's bested them, you right. know. Their own authors are either defunct or, you know, trailed away. It just happened to be that extraordinary fruition. And I happened to be 14 and full of hormones and, you know, growing <laughs> nine inches in a year or whatever. So... Obviously, to me, that's the thing I most wanted to write about. It occurred to me as I'm reading the book, and I think this is one of the things that I was so impressed by the, the novel approach here, is that if people were really honest with themselves, they probably only have two or three really important years in their lives to begin with. And oftentimes yeah. when someone writes a memoir, it winds up being this very, very dense list of, of accomplishments yeah. and near accomplishments. And, and 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 to me to to focus on on one year is such a 
it's such a brilliant idea because you know, I can think of certain years in my life where I grew the most, not just you know, physically, but mm. in, you know, spiritually, intellectually, creatively, all yeah, those things. Yeah. And I think to have done it that way is really admirable because you avoided so much of the heaviness of so many of these of these memoirs and kept it light and easy to read. Well, also, I was still a boy, you know, so I was at school. I was enthralled to my parents and my teachers. I hadn't got out and learned to make my own mistakes. If I write anything later about about later on in my life, there's going to inevitably be a lot of stuff about, oh, I shouldn't have done that. No, oh, dear. And I regret this. And actually, I'm not even going to mention that, <laughs> let alone people who um, I haven't got anything good to say about. So I wouldn't put them in the book. You know, there's only there's only one 1967 for me. And I was there's only one. You know, it's it's the pure me before anything went wrong before I had basically had any responsibility for myself. And arguably, as soon as you are responsible for yourself, it's a whole other game, as I learned. Your experience of going to, uh, to Winchester, which, which you know, for people who haven't read the book yet, it is a, a boarding school. You're at the age of 14. Mm. And it's interesting to me because, you know, it seems like in the book, the idea of sending you to a boarding school or, or to Winchester specifically was like a foregone conclusion. And, and I think of myself... <laughs> You know, as a parent, wondering whether I could be stoic enough to send my kids to school like that, or whether I'd just be a, a puddle of of nervous regret. And I'm, I'm, I think I'd probably lean more towards the puddle. Tell tell me a little bit about your parents and them sending you to school, and and d how did they see your growth in 1967? Well, they probably still thought it was positive because I hadn't started doing things that would get me into trouble, but I did very soon after that you know, and they also, of course, were privately educated, they were put through boarding school. So people repeat patterns, you know, people do what was done to them. I don't suppose my father had a good time at all at school, in fact, but he went straight from boarding school, he was at a kind of minor public boarding school, which I imagine was utterly brutal. And then um, was sent straight, went straight into the army. He joined up because it was World War II. So by the time he was 22, he'd been in institutions his whole life and he couldn't move his left leg anymore. It was, couldn't bend the left knee because he'd been hit by the shrapnel in Normandy. And I think my mother had a better time of it, but I, they got me to get into this very academic, prestigious academic school. It had its own entrance examination. I think all of the other boarding schools took a thing, to get in, you took a thing called common entrance, you know, in Latin, French, maths, geography, history, whatever it was. Um, but Winchester had its own and it was, it was an elite place. I was being told that I was a clever boy to get in there. Um, I took the exam again, in fact, once I was in there and I was awarded what they call an exhibition, which means part of my fees were paid, but not as much as if I was a scholar, in which case the whole fees are paid. And I'm sure it was really expensive, you know, it was it, it was an elite, not, not so much a so social snobbery, but intellectual snobbery. So the people that got looked down on were the really dumb people. Um, and I don't even know, I don't even know how they got in. Uh, you know, it was, so I think my parents thought I was doing jolly well, you know, and then I, you know, beat music led to soft drugs or whatever, you know, and just the things you had to take back then, pot and acid and things. And then that didn't go so well with, you know, that's a whole other story. <laughs> Um, you know, I, but I, I, I never became a drug addict, but everybody had to go through that sort of rite of passage at that stage. And, but I don't, I don't mention any of that in the book. The book is simply me wondering what it must be like to get stoned and, you know, have the big boys smoked, smoked pot. And it turns out they had, you know, but it was all kind of, I knew it was out there somewhere. <laughs> Um, it, 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 a lot of it's about looking up to people, the whole hierarchical business, me looking up to the big boys who look up to Brian Eno, who's a student at the local art school and, and runs these two happenings I, I write about, um, who then five years later turned up in feather boas in Roxy music. 
And, you know, looking up and at the very top of the tree was Bob Dylan, this American guy, what, 12 years older than me, who apparently knew the meaning of life. Yeah. Dylan was the most important element in our culture back then. Everybody I, looked up to Bob Dylan. I want to ask you about that because you, you, you wrote very, very succinctly about Bob Dylan and the kind of influence that he had on you early on and how profound it was. Tell me about what those records meant to you at that time. I, you, you say, you know, it seemed like he had like the, the, the message of, of life. At 14 years old, he probably did. Oh, I think he did as soon as I got to Winchester and heard him singing like a Rolling Stone. I'd never heard him before. I'd never heard that voice. So the first thing I heard was this six minutes of, you know, jubilant ranting. Um, I didn't analyze it at the time, but his voice contained so many opposite emotional directions. Like he was in a way prophesying doom. In a way, he was quite gleefully kind of pointing out how meaningless all human activity was. Mm. Um, he was the man for the job. But there was a terrific elation in it. So it wasn't like, oh, God, here comes this guy. What a bummer. You know, it was actually, how does it feel was also a kind of expression of liberation. You know, my God, you've got nothing. You ain't got nothing. You've got nothing to lose. God. I've never heard that before. You know, to have that as a mantra when you're 13, it didn't set me out on the path of, you know, abstinence and denial, and I'm going to give away everything I have. To, maybe I should have done, you know, should have set me off to being a, a some kind of monk or mystic. But, oh, he just contained, as he said recently, he contained multitudes in his voice. He contained so many things, which a lot of them then vanished. You know, he no longer, he's never done such exuberant the, the exuberance when you know he he remained he's always emotionally profound and there's a a terrific sadness at the bottom of it i think but i think he was also he i think he got calloused and i think even back then he was getting callous but there's still bits where he, there's a terrific compassion in his voice yeah. even while he's going on about how meaningless it is you you just get that. He also keeps the cards that read have mercy on his soul. And that absolutely gets to me even today, just that sentence. Um, it, it was like he basically stared to the bottom and seen what it was all about. Yeah. yeah well, I think when you listen to those early Bob Dylan records, I mean, you, you do hear something that is that's totally unique. And, and lyrically, he's just it's, at such a young age. He's so he's so profound. I think one of the problems that Bob Dylan has had, and, and maybe you can respond to this, is that it's very hard to maintain yourself when your legacy is greater than who than who you are as a human being. It's a it's a lot to yeah. be Bob Dylan, and to have that to know the kind of importance that you have had and impact on people's lives. It's got to be very difficult to just constantly try to live with that constantly on your shoulders. Yeah, I mean, I I think it, once you've written whatever he came up with in the first five years, there's no way of beating that, you yeah. know, there's no way of, he, 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 he kind of then distanced himself and kind of went all country and oh shucks. And that's just me. And, <laughs> you know, made like a incredibly trite music for a while. And, you know, Nashville skyline and all those covers, although there was also some great songs in there, you know, but it was too late. He'd already attracted a horde who thought that whatever he did, was gold dust and it was like life of brian basically you know <laughs> um and i saw his comeback at the isle of Wight, which was almost deliberately disappointing you know he was not sounding like himself and singing the old songs like he didn't feel it anymore and you know it was but everybody still went wow wow you know it, at, in the end it's like the jewish food in the jewish old folks home it was it was not good and there wasn't enough of it you know um <laughs> And um, I think he's had to play games with, you know, people's expectations ever since and, and probably just give up and just do what he does. And I think he's also somebody who uh, he can't re-inhabit his past. So if he does old songs, he kind of has to do them differently. He has to mess them up, basically. If he's, It's like the, the paint doesn't dry. 
you know, and they, but it becomes a runny mess. I, I don't go with the theory of, oh man, I think his new version of Ballad of a Thin Man is wonderful. You know, he, it's now a game where he plays old songs and sees if you can recognize them or not. But if you see him playing newer material, he's still into it, you know. I think he just gets bored probably. And like you said, I imagine he probably gave up years ago trying to compete with his own legacy. I mean, if you've written Blonde on Blonde, where the hell do you go? You know, it's like, I never got there, but you know, it gave me something to aim for and miss. So I still think of Visions of Johanna, you know, that one on Blonde on Blonde is the ultimate song. And there are many songs I've learned to love since then, but you know, I'll never, <laughs> I'll never write anything that profound or that extraordinary but it certainly gave me the idea that it was possible so i've it's, it's made me more ambitious or made more random or free range or open-minded about what i put in a song um because you never know what's going to be a fantastic line but you've also yeah. never set yourself up to try to get to that to get to that level you've you've never stopped saying you never at this point said I, I, I'm never going to get to that point. I don't even know why I'm going to try. I mean, you have released so much wonderful music that even if you don't feel as if you've reached that level, you've reached a level that you know most people can only dream of. You've been a prolific artist since you know since the Soft Boys and beyond. Well, thank you. I mean, it's good to have somebody to look up to. Yeah, something to look up to. If you sat there going, "Oh man." I've done it. I'm on the plateau, you know, <laughs> or I'm up there with the greats and there's nowhere else to go. I don't know what that would be like. I I still see myself as basically sweeping up after the 60s. You know, another reason for that book, Dylan and the Beatles. And actually, I think I've been more influenced by the Beatles musically than Dylan. And these days when I write songs, I'm still basically, they're all something that might have gone on the White Album. Um, but I, I have absorbed that music so much that I'm basically like a little AI machine that's been programmed with Revolver and Blonde on Blonde <laughs> and uh, the Basement Tapes and the White Album, you know, and, right. and um, but throw in Piper at the Gates of Dawn and, you know, a, a few other great records. And I'm just there... I'm just like a little machine that processes them, I suppose. And I, and I add my own ex emotional experience to that. But in terms of style and in terms of what I'm trying to do with a song, I'm, I am I'm made no advance on the sixties and I'm not trying to, you know, Yeah. I, I love Bowie and, and Roxy music. I think they were terrific, but I don't think, man, Bowie and Brian Ferry, ah, wow, they whipped the Beatles' ass, you know. I mean, they, they would tell you they didn't and they couldn't. Yeah. Know? As well as the book, you've also released the, the, the record too, 1967 oh, Vacations yeah. in the Past. A lot of artists have released cover albums. I don't see this as that. I, I see this as, as a soundtrack. I, I see this as a, yeah. as a mixtape. I mean, these are, these are not just a collection of songs that happen to be from one year. These are songs that really meant something to you at a, at a young age and really kind of informed the kind of artist that you would become, you know, for the rest of, of your career. I mean, you talk about the Beatles, the Kinks, uh, Hendrix, the move, uh, you know, Pink Floyd. Yeah. I thought what you did for Whiter Shade of Pale was absolutely stunning. I thought it was an absolutely beautiful, you know, rendition oh, of you. it. You, you sometimes, wow. when you hear some of those old recordings, I mean, the great songs, but sometimes when you take them into a more, acoustic setting and someone's really kind of showing you the real beauty of the song you really start to look at it at a different perspective and, and i mean i've been playing procol harem on the radio for 35 years but yet the, yes. to hear you do it you just sit there and go my god this song is more beautiful than i than perhaps i had given it credit for it's an it's an amazing performance Ooh. by you well you're very kind I, I think not everybody feels that way in fact the guy i was just waving to leaving the house <laughs> is uh davy who was Davy Lane, who plays the on a guitar, but it sounds like a Mellotron. Yeah. We recorded that in Sydney, but he's over here with us right now. But um, yeah, I think those songs, the way they were done at the time, most of them had very state-of-the-art production. 
I mean, maybe not the incredible string band so much, but certainly the Beatles and Hendrix and Pink Floyd, particularly the Pink Floyd track, you know, See Emily Play, which was the kind of zenith of Sid Barrett's creativity. He was having his, I think he was beginning to have his breakdown even as they were recording it, but it yeah. was his, his top 10 hit, you know. Um, those were extremely produced records. It was the time when, as they say, the studio was becoming an instrument. Man, you've got to play the studio. And I've never really had the patience to do that. Maybe because I'm, I'm such a Dylanite at heart. I just like to go in there with a the guitar and bang it out as fast as I can and move on to the next thing, which is not the attitude that you necessarily need as a recording artist. And probably why I've never had a hit record because I've never... I've never thought about the record as the record. I've just thought about it as I want to get this down on tape and move on. I don't, I don't, <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm, I'm not very patient with the listener, I'm afraid. So I just took these songs and I played them as if they were folk songs, which they now are, you know, 50, 60 years later. They've entered our, the, the psychic bloodstream of our culture. They are the boomers lament or whatever you know they'll all be playing when our coffins go into the <laughs> incinerator or deep into the ground or whatever you know there's just in fact I'm a friend of mine journalist who died relatively young I think he was in his 50s he had eight miles high playing as his coffin went into the incinerator and um, you know it, it that's that's where we're at man <laughs> So I'm, but I'm just reversed that basically and just did it all as if I was there with an acoustic and a friend, which indeed I was. Most of them are either me and Davey or me and Kimberly Rue with two acoustics. The song choices that you, you made are, are pretty interesting. You know, songs like No Face, No Name, No Number from Traffic uh, was really interesting. You know, uh, you know Burning oh, the Midnight Lamp from Jimi Hendrix. Both of those songs are wonderful, but... They're probably not songs that, that fans of either Traffic or Jimi Hendrix would think to cover. How did you select these songs? Was it What was the process of that? Well, I think Burning of the Midnight Lamp, I thought, would work with two acoustic guitars in a way that, say, Purple Haze wouldn't. And uh, Traffic, I love Traffic, but I thought that no face, no name, no number would probably sound pretty good on an acoustic and a Mellotron. So it was what would work taken down to that simplest level. In fact, I think I'm the only person. Yeah, I'm, I, that, that was just me. And then uh, no face, no name, no number. I also sing it in the original key, which is a bit rash, I think, because I can barely hit the notes. But it makes it sound more, sounds more painful, you know. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a, probably it's, about half half the speed as well, because Steve Winwood would have been eighteen or something when he when they recorded that. It's an amazing song, and again, you did such a a great job with it. You know, one of the things that, that I that I did notice though is so last year you released Life After Infinity, which was you know a completely instrumental record, and it was beautiful. Oh, yeah, thank uh, you. I really enjoyed it, and, and and the reason I bring it up is that there's there's a similar reflective feel to the way those songs were presented to, to what you've done with 1967. You know, back to back, those records actually sound amazing together. Was that something that was intentional oh. or was that you know, just pure coincidence? No, but they were done, I think that they were actually done more or less in the same year. I think Life After Infinity. Oh, what's that in the background? That's my uh, that's my that... dog howling. <laughs> oh, I thought it might be. I was wondering. Okay, good. Yep. What kind of dog have you? What he, have you got? He is. Uh, is he is an American bulldog. He's a. Uh, oh, how uh, old is he? He's a. He's eleven years old. Oh wow. Okay, so he's he's been around. Oh yeah, he's seen he's seen quite enough. <laughs> oh well, I hope he's okay. He's he's fine. There he is. Yeah, he's fine. He just wants attention. That's all. What's he called? He's Lou. He's Lou. He's Lou. Oh wow! Yeah. Wow. Hey Lou, where is, is he? Well, he's in there somewhere. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, down, <laughs> down at the bottom. Yeah. So anyway, but but uh, those two records have have a, a, a similar feel to it. Well, they're both mostly on acoustic guitar. Um, they were both mixed by Charlie in in um, Cardiff, and Life After Infinity was mostly recorded there, and some of this one was. 
I mean, they were both, they were my wife's idea, Emma's idea. She said, oh, why don't you do an instrumental album? She sort of sees what my tendencies are and then says, well, why don't you actually do that? You know, and I'm, you know, noodling around on a guitar or something. So why don't you make a record of that? Or, you know, you're, you know, she said pretty much what you said, you know, okay, you've got the book coming out. Why don't you do a soundtrack? And that's why it's not just a covers album. It is indeed me. I think I, I mean, I talk about half those songs, Waterloo yeah. Sunsets, definitely in the book. And, um, Hendrix is in the book, not necessarily that thing. You know, Pink Floyd is in the book, that that C. Emily play and Sid Barrett. And obviously the Beatles are all over it. I didn't put any Dylan in because Dylan didn't actually release anything in 1967 mm. um, or not that came out in Britain. So I was just being very literal. Hey, this is these are the 1967 songs. There was a lot of great American music that didn't get to Britain till the following year. So there's nothing from Love or The Doors or The Velvet Underground or The Airplane or The Dead, you know, people that I then listen or Captain Beefheart, you know, a lot of my US favorites didn't reach the shores of Britain till 68 because record, you know, and there was no, there was no instant access to music then, which is why it mattered so much. Yeah. yeah. If you saw a kid walking around with an import copy of the new Jefferson Airplane album, it was like, whoa, all <laughs> hail, hallelujah, mighty one. Oh, God, you've got an import copy with a gatefold sleeve, you sage dude, you know. <laughs> um, that was how one of the ways status was measured with, at school was sort of looking at who's got the hip import records. Well, you, you talk about that in the book, that there is there is a hierarchical structure to being in that environment yeah yeah and, but that the music tends to bring it it well it seems to bring a lot of those groups together i mean there's always going to be something that you don't like yeah. but for the most part the music in that environment seemed to be the string that put everybody you know on on the same path well again it's tribal badges isn't it really you know i'm talking about the groovers and the meatheads and the groovers were basically hipsters they're they were professors kids and they've probably grown up to be professors themselves and they they tended towards dylan and jazz and they were the ones who were going to smoke pot first and the meatheads listened to the beach boys and um talked longingly about sex and uh, their big kick was to go off and smoke cigarettes and drink beer and <laughs> um and then but then there was the beatles that everybody loved the beatles was common ground and that's what drew it you know they were they were the Beatles was such a hub amongst other things. Yeah. But yeah, you know, and I don't know if that's the case now. It was definitely the case in the, you know, in the seventies when punk rock appeared and indie singles came out. There was the whole kind of when there were only fifteen indie singles, you could still collect all of them. You know, and um, I mean, you'd have still been about ten or eleven when that. That was probably around the time you became aware of music. I don't know. I think you know, f for me, you know, I was I I, I came from a for a town that was you know kind of sheltered musically in a lot of ways. I mean, if if you didn't, where like, was that? It was in uh, south of Boston, but it was in a, in a in a very yeah. very small town where if you you didn't like, uh, you know, where the Cars and Tom Petty were considered punk bands, and if you didn't like Skinner, there was something wrong with you. And uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so it was, those are those are lean times. But when I when I went away to college, you know, it was it was like someone had opened the door. Very in a way, very similar to the experience you had at, at Winchester. I went to school a thousand miles away. There was no going home. This is where I was at. And then all of a sudden, I started to absorb music like a sponge, including the music of Robin Hitchcock. So and this would have been you know 1983 to 1988, 89. You know, yeah. To me, that was my 1967. Were, were those years, and there was a lot of music coming in that you know that I I still listen to and I still you know go back to and 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 reference. So you know the idea of of you going back to 1967, I think is very relatable to a lot of people because we all have those yeah. those years yeah. that mean something. Yes, and they also affect what's the, what's going to come next. I suppose you know like the the rock and roll kids. The Beatles, you know, the people who grew up with Chuck Berry and Little Richard and Bo Diddley and um, Elvis Presley and 
all all men of course um but you know i didn't i mean i did have a bill haley record when i was two my dad bought that from somewhere but um i can't claim to be an original rocker but the people that we listened to my generation listened to in, in 66 67 had all grown up with rock and roll they've been teenagers they've been like same as me you know just just through puberty when rock and roll hit so it it went really deeply into them and then you know e each generation seeds it, the next one to some extent yeah but i don't know if it's quite like i don't know if people feel like the way about music now because music's really easy to find even in your time in 83 84 you would have presumably have had to either hear it on college radio or go to the record shop I hear from other people that it's really hard to find new music, but the reality is it was always hard to find new music. You had to go physically go to a record store or read a magazine or, you know, do all these things to, to, to find it. I think there's less of that, that tribalism that, that you talked about in, in, in the book that we just, you know, referenced a minute ago yeah. today than there was 30, 40 years ago. I think it, it is different. And I think it's mostly because, you know, the delivery systems have made it free and it's not like you've invested your time and your money and energy no, to obtain no. something. I, the obtaining of music isn't the same. I think it's on a, you know, from a consumer point of view, I understand it and, and, and maybe that's good, but from, there's a part of me that really misses the idea of, of, of buying that album, having something, you know, to hold on to and say, this is something that I've just discovered. And it's, it's, it's a shame that that doesn't exist in the same way anymore. Yeah, that's what, I mean, you know, it did exist and it's, that's one of the things. I mean, I'm sure tribes continue, um, but it's, they're probably tribal about something different now. And because kids now grow up looking to the phone as their first way of contacting the world, things are different. Humanity is, itself is changing. And and I think we're going to, I think we are, we are merging with our phones. And I suppose the question is, can we physically merge with our phones? Because if so, then we'll never lose them. And, uh, you know, will we wind up with some kind of supplement of artificial intelligence? Are we the last generations to be organic human life? And I would think it's quite likely we are. I think humanity may continue, but not in its physical form and actually a, a more effective life form that is humanoid, but essentially uh, what used to be called a robot um, will supersede it. And they'll, and they'll have to be a bit telepathic. Yeah. Otherwise they'll tear each other to pieces, but um, will those things have souls? I don't know. Fake it till you make it. The robot in search of a feeling, you know, it's an interesting, I, I imagine, I, the, I mean, they can create art. So it's nice to think that human suffering is the sort of what we distill from that is our, is art. And that despite the appalling savagery of our species, we're still capable of you know, the, our legacy, our best legacy is music and art and whatever. But then who are we leaving it for? <laughs> yeah. Uh, is it going to reach other planets? And if so, would they get it? Would they Would they all groove on that? Would the people from Alpha Centauri like the Sistine Chapel or Sad-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands or, you know, um, <laughs> whatever well, it is that you culturally like, King Lear, you yeah. know? When you think about those things, simultaneously as you go through the process of of looking into your into your past history musically you know, yeah and, and all those things does that make you more reflective now than maybe any other time in your life have you always been reflective of the past or has all of this driven you in that direction no i've always been reflective of the past because not almost as soon as i left 1967 i could see as it receded that something beautiful was getting further away hmm. and that a state of mind not just my you know perfect little 14 year old body and brain you know un unpolluted by cigarettes and all the rest was that, that was that was eden you know um and we were going into the 
into an uncertain and scary future. And actually, you know, things were uncertain, uncertain and scary in 1966, 67. Vietnam War was raging. There was, you know, the, the old nuclear annihilation was as prominent as ever. America and China were getting to get nasty about each other. It was all, you know, like it is today, but sort of looks a bit quainter, but actually human nature was as foul as it still is <laughs> uh and still and still capable of odd flashes of beauty and yeah. um but what we didn't have was ai what we didn't have was climate change um, and what we didn't have was the internet so in some ways there was a people probably had to be more patient but no i've always looked back i've always i've, I've always been a nostalgist <laughs> yeah you know, as soon as I had anything to nostalgize about. Um, and so, so, you know, towards the end of my life, I, I see where I'm at now. I'm I'm just keen to capture bits of my memory and pass them on to people. Because they also, I think, go with the music I've made. And I, there's no way of telling if any, anything will still be here in 20 years' time, let alone 50. Because the mediums keep changing, there's no tablets of stone. I mean, vinyl is as good as anything. You put something on CD, it goes. You put something on cassette, it goes. You put something on a, on a computer, and then it goes into a memory stick, then it goes into the cloud where does it go from there we, we we're st everything now is stored but nothing can be stored for very long because the formats keep changing yeah so i can't be bothered to learn how to work out something because in five years time it's going to be different <laughs> you know and i i have a, a fear of technology you know i'm sure it bruises my fragile ego to be assaulted by all these things that other people can understand and i don't but I also, I don't think it's got us anywhere. You know, people are still as, we're in even more a hurry than we ever were, despite all our labor saving gadgets. You know, people are brilliant, but they're also idiotic. And um, you have to bear in mind, you are one of them, he said, talking to himself. So I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I want to encapsulate things, that's yeah. all, before I go. And then if there's anything, it, it's it's always hard to imagine the world after you've gone, but um, you know, even if it's only AI machines sitting by a heavenly bath somewhere in some five dimensional digital paradise, leafing through the entire works of mankind in a nanosecond, they'll be able to take in, oh, right, okay, that bloke who wrote the 1967 book, here's another one, you know, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Well, I, I have to say, Robin, I'm, I'm glad we were finally able to to do this. I, I have really enjoyed the book. I really enjoyed the record. And, you know, I have a whole stack of Robin Hitchcock records that uh, that are in my collection. And are, oh, those Lord. are never going to go away either. So a real pleasure to talk to you again. Well, and you. Lovely to talk to you at last. Um, <laughs> special thanks to my wife, Emma, for facilitating this meeting and um hopefully we'll meet up soon i hope so and um and my best to lou <laughs> thank you robin <laughs> all right take care now take care the name of robin hitchcock's new book is called 1967 how i got there and how i never left and the name of the new album is 1967 vacations in the past he's also coming to the city winery in boston on october 29th Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. Remember to follow us on Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook for regular updates. You can also email me at fax at rock102.com. I'd love to hear what you think. Thanks again to Metro, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, and Ram at Chicopee, but most of all, thanks to you for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.